ICPA Town Hall, a high-impact news broadcast to help you navigate the most pressing issues facing the profession. Get timely and critical information, real-time interpretation and analysis. Learn strategies, best practices, and capabilities to drive long-term success for your clients and organization. Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. We've got a great show planned for you. We're gonna be covering a lot of timely information, doing our best to analyze it and providing some really interesting firm strategies to help you advance your overall capabilities. So uh, real quickly, we'll kick things off with a DC and profession update with Mark Peterson. Then Lisa Simpson and Kerry Hipsack are going to get into uh, some of the technical updates related to business relief and other matters. Lisa's then going to do a business season debrief uh, with two tax practitioners. We're going to talk about the client accounting services area, which is experiencing explosive growth. And then we're going to close with our open forum and closing remarks. So we've actually got two slides of presenters here today. We've got so many people on today's town hall. We will introduce them as they join. And what I, who I'd like to introduce right now is Mark Peterson, who's the EVP for the advocacy area for the AICPA, and you know him well. Welcome, Mark. Good to see you, Eric. So, Mark, we want to get right into it. Uh, and the last town hall, Barry talked about uh, the prospects of uh, three potential bills. Um, but that was two weeks ago. So what's what's the latest and things continue to, uh, you know, evolve there in D.C.? They, they do. They are evolving. Um, you know, there's been this consistent effort to try and put something together, a reconciliation bill. Originally, it was the Build Back Better, large bill. Uh, we talked about that, you know, late summer into the fall. It became less and less likely. Again, this is a, a, a partisan effort. It is, is done through reconciliation which means uh, just a simple majority, but that means the Democrats uh, have to hold every vote. Uh, very easy in the in the House, not so easy in the Senate. And one of the names that's popped up has been Senator Manchin from West Virginia in that conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's been driving uh, into this year and into the spring. And and the, one of the three opportunities that Barry had mentioned was reconciliation, kind of a smaller package. Mm -hmm. um, since then, uh, Senator Manchin actually, you know, did a campaign ad and he mentioned the fact that he wasn't going to vote for anything that he couldn't explain at home uh, and he focused on Build Back Better. So that is not a good indication for the for uh, something happening. There are a couple other opportunities um, through reconciliation. There's the possibility of something kind of at the year end in tax extenders, uh, again, smaller, but could have some tax impact. And then there's a significant piece of legislation, really the only bipartisan thing that's been moving, Eric, related to uh, competition with China. Uh, and there may be some efforts, if they can get agreement to attach some provisions, again, everything has been um, been reduced in size to that legislation. But then there's another factor if you wanna to go to the next slide. Well, Mark, just on, I mean, Manchin's clearly making his intentions well known by putting statements in campaign ads. And the other thing, we'll go to the next slide, but just, you know, everyone's watching inflation in the economy. And I, mean, I saw reports yesterday, the senators, uh, you know, concerned about where, where the, where, where the economy is going. Even outside of, of reconciliation or a large tax package, there has been discussion and actually a pack, package, 55 billion uh, for more uh, economic relief for smaller venues passed the House of Representatives, but it's not likely to pass the Senate because of the inflation point that you just made. Yeah. Okay, well, this is uh, looks at Mark. This is a complex calendar. So I know you add, you like add like the, the tyranny of the calendar to the complexity of the politics and the policy. But the reality is, is there's about 40 days, maybe a little over 40 days before they are scheduled to leave for the election. This is an election year, so traditionally they leave early. I got to tell you, uh, if they get their work done, they'll try and get out of here early. If there's something that gets pushed to the very end and it's really important. Uh, they could always add days to this schedule, but it's not a lot of time. Uh, and that means that trying to get something significant done in that amount of time, get agreement um, on it is extremely challenging. Having said that, if for some reason they were to get agreement, it can move really quickly. So um, there is the possibility, that's why we keep talking about it, but um, I, I think the challenge 
becomes greater and greater every day that ticks by. Next slide. You know, the other thing we've been talking about, Eric, uh, is, is the IRS issues. We're wrapping up filing season, as everybody knows. Uh, a ton of work last year going into trying um, to provide relief for taxpayers and practitioners because of the situation at the IRS. Um, we're not done just because of uh, the tax season being over. There's still a massive backlog. We're assessing where they are in the backlog. And we're really, really trying to figure out what's our next approach um, from an advocacy perspective. And this is the kind of thing that we could easily be reaching out to the town hall community on. Um, we had a very short term uh, uh, focus on some on actionable things that we could get done. Um, notices, penalty relief, trying to get uh, these surge squads to the IRS to try and help with the backlog. Um, it's still an incredibly uh, large issue. We, we are going to continue to provide solutions for the long term, as well as monitor this backlog because it's got to get done before we go into next next filing season. I'm sorry, I'm talking about next filing season. Um, and we also have um, the commissioner whose term expires, I, I believe, in November or this year anyway. Um, you know, he could stay on after his term expires, but there could be tr some transition there. Um, and with that, next slide. Well, Mark, just one thing that, so you're really taking a step back here. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you, the team's been working so ferociously over the past many months just on every matter, but now it's just time you guys are going to take a, take a step back and really review what is the best strategy related to, all, to due dates, practice management, all the items noted here. Absolutely. And um, it's about, you know, kind of dealing with the lessons learned through the COVID experience, lessons learned through dealing with the IRS that's under duress, and then to take all of those lessons and think about what, what's the advice and the direction that we can give to policymakers in order to get the IRS headed in the right direction. Okay. So earlier this week, as a matter of fact, the commissioner was up at the appropriation subcommittee that funds the IRS testifying. And really, you know, the focus from the IRS is funding. Uh, well, we can't really make long-term improvement unless we have a stable funding mechanism. Um, he did highlight the fact that they suspended some notices, and we appreciated that. We called for a lot of it. He's, he said that he's evaluating uh, penalty relief options. Um, evaluating when you're asked in a hearing really means that you're trying to get out of the question, but um, that was the answer. Uh, you know, the, the funding thing is not going to be straightforward, to be honest. Uh, you'll remember last year there were some uh, taxpayer information leaks that came out of, out of the IRS uh, through ProPublica, high, high net wealth individuals, but still um, there's a lot of focus on what happened to the leak and how are they going to address those issues. Uh, so funding is going to be controversial. Um, there is no doubt that they're going to have to ha deal with technology and talent and funding as a part of that. But but funding also has to have some focus on service. So it can't just be enforcement. It also has to have a focus on service. And, and there are areas of bipartisan support. Uh, technology is a huge one. Um, and then again, you know, the, the, the probably the, the poster child for all of this is the ability to get your uh, questions answered, whether it's through correspondence or through somebody answering the phone that not only answers the phone, but has the ability to answer your questions. Yeah, a lot, Mark, I can tell you a lot of, a lot of comments coming in on, you know, <laughs> get my phone answered and, and also about, you know, Red, Reddick's term expiring. So, yeah. So that's, again, going to be interesting to watch. And that's the kind of thing that we're assessing. So there's going to be a reflection about the direction of the IRS. We want to contribute to that. Um, you know, we stick up for the membership. We stick up for, for uh, taxpayers. But, but we, we want the IRS to function. Uh, and we're very supportive of them as well. So let me just wrap this up a little with some of the stuff that's going on. The state legislatures are wrapping up. There's a handful of them that are still in session. One of the issues that we've discussed in the past that is is real is the deregulatory movement around licensing. Most of it's around occupational licensing. However, a lot of these uh, pieces of legislation capture professional licensing, CPA licenses. Um, you know, there were close to 300 bills that were introduced, uh, 42 jurisdictions. So th there's just a lot of activity in this area. Well-funded libertarian groups, um, you know, really focused on reducing hurdles uh, for upward mobility, freedom, uh, deregulation, and we're getting captured in that. 
into, if you can get the people, if you can get policymakers to pay attention for two minutes, they understand they don't want to do, uh, to do anything to deteriorate the license for engineers and architects um, and CPAs. But at the end of a session, legislation moves. Um, we work again with those professional groups, the Alliance for Responsible Professional Licensing. Um, a lot of activity has gone on. There's a couple bills, tr very troublesome, that the coalition has been working on in Louisiana, again, as they wrap up their session. Um, that coalition has been very powerful and effective, and we have to be just because the number of um, bills that are flooding um, the zone. Um, and then the other one I wanted to mention, because even though some states, because of all the federal money that got pushed through them, actually are feeling a little flush, they are still focused on uh, budgetary concerns when that money runs out and it will run out. And so one of the things that's been discussed in more states than we've seen in the past is tax on professional services, hitting us, hitting the engineers and the architects, the realtors, others. Um, and actually a new twist on that, Eric, in Kentucky, we actually saw them not just on you know traditional services that we've seen in the past, but also on wealth management. And, and they actually were talking about putting a, um, a fee on top of professional exams. So there are some new elements to this we haven't seen in the past. We engaged and were successful in Kentucky, but it's the kind of thing we watch um, and, and we have to stay on top of them because it's a lot of states uh, and there's a lot of activity. Well, Mark, I mean, we, we do sometimes, we shouldn't just label this the DC and profession update. There's right. a lot of important activities going on in the states. Maybe that's something that we can crack, but this coalition you've put together or, or worked with on, on the licensing is really important and a lot of other, you know, state, state, state matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that, Mark, we're going to, we're going to bring up, uh, Lisa Simpson, uh, clearly a, a, a the town hall favorite here. So Lisa, <laughs> I will, uh, hand this off to you and have you and, uh, Carrie take us through these next two sections. Thanks, Eric. Welcome, Carrie. Good to see you again. Thank you, Lisa. Good to see you and be co-presenting and not just taking your place. <laughs> good point. Good point. Let's get into some of the good technical updates that you've brought us. And first, I think you're going to continue the ongoing saga of K2K3. Well, what do we have um, to talk about that's new with K2K3? Yeah. So on the slide, it's not advancing for me. If we can get to the next one. Here we Great, go. thank you. We have just one small change for FAQ number seven from the IRS that was made last week. You'll see it in the chart down below that is taken directly from the IRS FAQ page. They simply extended the e-filing capability date for Form 1120S. So what used to be about mid-June has now been deferred to July 24th, 2022. I did keep also an article on this page from the Journal of Accountancy that does dive a little bit more into the topic if you if anyone out there wants some narrative. So just right. a small update, but something to keep you all aware of. All right. And a, another continuing saga around PPP. We talked a couple of weeks ago about um, borrowers who neglected to file for forgiveness and neglected to start making payments when the payments were due. So the lender filed to the um, SBA for that guarantee. That was a huge component of the PPP program. So now, Carrie, I think you've got something new that um, we've recently come across. Yes, we've been informed of some of the notices. We had a redacted notice sent, shared with us that was sent from the SBA to a borrower that had a loan over a hundred thousand and it's come to our attention that there have been others and it's this notice to request payment on the loan lisa as you mentioned the ppps had a deferred payment of 10 months and after that it did have to either be forgiven or it had to be paid back so since the sba now holds some of these loans they are trying to request some of the money back with the notice that we saw, there were a couple of, of key features that I just wanted to highlight for everyone. One is that the loan will be referred to the Treasury for collection if it's not paid back. The second is that the Treasury may, may add 30% or more to the balance in interest and collection fees if it does 
if it does happen to go through that process. And then finally, the loan balances may be offset by the treasury through a variety of um, uh, state reductions or withholdings. I have some examples down below, whether it's federal or state income taxes, um, federal salary, military salary, or federal retirement pay, federal or state contract or vendor payments, federal or state benefit payments, such as social security payments. So I know this sounds a little bit a little bit terrifying, but let's move on to the rainbow in the storm with the next slide. That is that the SBA is aware that borrowers still have time to apply for forgiveness, even if the loan did become due. So the SBA is currently working to develop a process to allow forgiveness to be requested after the SBA has guaranteed a loan from a lender. So Lisa, this is just a recycling of your slide from two weeks ago. But again, this is the good news that there is still work in process to ensure that those loans that have gone to the SBA do still have an opportunity to be forgiven and won't have to be repaid. So uh, I'll tell you, I've seen the, the redacted notice and it looks kind of fishy and kind of scary at the same time. So if any of your clients or if, if your company is getting a notice like that, put it into the Q&A for us and, um, and we just want to see what the volume of activity is that's going on around these notices. And Carrie, I know you um, caught some recent testimony from the SBA Administrator Guzman, who was testifying in front of the Senate Small Business Committee. Um, it was a couple of weeks ago, but what was your key takeaway from that interview? Yeah, so this is actually just last week. I know time is flying by. It's a blur. <laughs> But last week there was this hearing. Um, there was a lot of review of all that the SBA has done during COVID. But the main takeaway is that there are budgetary increase requests for the SBA because during COVID, the SBA was able to show all that they were able to do for the small business community. Now there was acknowledgement that not every process or procedure was perfect and there is still an opportunity for some improvement but ultimately they are working hard, knowing all that they could accomplish during COVID. They're working hard to continue to be a source of resources for small and medium, sorry, small businesses throughout the US. So just stay tuned for additional information coming from the SBA. They're still working hard to get their name out there. And again, just be a resources for those small businesses across the country that might need a little assistance getting um, back to normal or getting started for some of the entrepreneurial spirits out there. And Carrie, when we um, connect with the SBA leadership and and the lent, through the lender group that, that we've been a part of since the um, PPP program began, they are really focused on um, access to capital for small businesses, especially underrepresented minorities. Um, I, and to your point, there were some, some challenges along the way. I know when I was in, in, um, in practice, if a client was turning to an SBA loan, I was like, well, it's going to take a while. So the lender group that we're engaged with is actually trying to work with the SBA on some recommendations to streamline access and just the process around getting those SBA loans fulfilled. So, um, you know, hopefully it will become an even more attractive financing op um, opportunity for small business. Thank you so much, Carrie. It was great to get to uh, interview you instead of actually um, presenting the, the um, technical update. So appreciate that. Of course. Thank you, Lisa. Um, just one more reminder for the audience before I take my leave. Our, our AICPA tax team does put out a tax season survey. We are reliant on the input from practitioners to uh, provide us direction for what your needs are from us. So if you could take this quick survey, it's eight questions, but your insights are truly invaluable. So click on this link in the downloads if you could, and just make a few moments to do that if you haven't already. All right. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. So next, I'm excited to um, introduce a couple of our Tax Practice Management Committee volunteers. We've got Brandon Lagarde and Brent Forbush. Brandon is with Postal Weight in Netterville, which is a top 100 firm based out of Louisiana. And Brent is with, he's the managing partner 
of um, Forbush and Associates in Reno, Nevada. So thank you guys. You've both been really invaluable volunteers and uh, I appreciate you joining me today. I, I roped you all into this because I saw an article and I've got a link to the article on this slide that you did with April Walker from our tax team around busy season debriefs. So uh, you can blame April, but um, one of the things I wanted to start with is I wanna make sure we all agree that debriefs are not just for tax pr practitioners, right? Um, I was in um, business and industry before I came to the AICPA. We had a, a couple of really intensive sales cycles within the calendar year. So four weeks of just, you know, gas, um, full gas, and then a couple of weeks to catch breath and then another cycle. So I would use a, a busy season debrief to figure out what, you know, kind of what we could improve for the next one. So audit, tax, business and industry, after a big project, you know, I think this is um, project agnostic. So um, with that, let's get started. Brandon, I wanted to start with you and get your insights into why you feel like a busy season debrief is important and in when you approach the timing of that. Yeah, thanks Lisa. Um, glad to be here with such a great group. Um, so we were asked to kind of give our thoughts on our the way that we approach kind of after tax season and, and tax season is, um, I'll, I'll, I'm a big LSU football fan. So tax seasons, you know, if you, if you um, look at sort of a football game, it's a game, you know, it's, it's a challenge we have to get through and a tax season debrief is almost like you know, watching game film after the game is done. You plan for the tax season. You try to, you know, change some things, modify things. Um, there's a lot of work that has to be done in a very um, short period of time. And it's important to kind of watch that post game film to say, okay, what do we do? Right. You know, did we make that block correctly? Did we mess something up? Um, did we do something really well that we can improve on? So it's, it's really, really important to me. It's probably more important than the planning. Um, is the postseason uh, debrief. Uh, we kind of talked a little bit before this about timing, and we recognize that, you know, we're two weeks after tax season, after um, the most recent tax season. Here in Louisiana, we haven't had a, a regular tax season in quite some time where we had a, a finite end date um, that was consistent with what we're used to. Um, we actually had an August 15th uh, end date last year based on disasters. Um, but timing, you know, it's important to do soon after the end of busy season because we all know that things get lost. Our memories fade quickly. Um, but at the same time, we look at it as our tax team needs a break. Uh, we need time off. We need to relax. Um, so right now is really the, the, the prime time to, again, watch that, that game film. I love that analogy. I'm an SEC football fan, so I, I get it. Um, so Brent, you're, you're in a much smaller firm. You've got about 10 people. Do you still feel like a, a busy season debrief is important? Like you're talking to your entire team every day, I would assume, but do you still find that value in the debrief? Yeah, I don't have a great football analogy like uh, Brandon does, but uh, it is. I think it's highly important. Um, and kind of like Brandon was saying, we try to kind of take it a little bit away from, you know, we're not going two days after tax day and saying, okay, let's, let's debrief now, uh, give people a bit of time to decompress and think about kind of all those things. But even with our team, so we're, we're about 13 now, but we break into like a tax and audit group and then a CAS group. Right. And so it's great from that perspective, because when we do get all back together and yes, we are talking to each other almost every day and we, uh, have some team members that are kind of remote and, you know, they get the hybrid. We let our team members choose how they work. It is that time that we can come all back together and even say, hey, from CAS, what worked well in how you assisted tax or, you know, got information to flow to tax or tax? How, you know, how can CAS better assist in the process that we're, you know, getting to year end or, or getting financials or getting tax returns out the door? So, it is, even though we talk, um, it's a great opportunity for us to to kind of be collaborative and kind of remember that we still are one team at the end of the day, even though we have different responsibilities. I think, you know, from my perspective, the last couple of years have been so we, we've mostly been heads down buried in the in the day to day that you have to do to get through 
um, to get your clients their PPP loan or, or to answer their ERC questions or, you know, then to actually get their tax returns done or get their audited reports out the door. And sometimes it's just hard to pick your head up and look around and go, okay, deep breath. What can I be doing differently? So would you guys agree that's kind of the one of the benefits of, of the debrief? Yeah, absolutely. As you mentioned, it's a, it's a chance to turn your attention to kind of to your strategic plan instead of just, again, completing tasks. And like you said, over the last two years, we haven't had a, a real strong break in that um, cycle of work. And so it's really, I mean, this may be one of the best opportunities we have to sit back and really kind of debrief on what happened. So let's talk about how you approach planning. So you got to have a well-planned session to make it be meaningful. So Brandon, you've got how many people in your tax department? We have uh, roughly 70 folks in our tax department uh, across, uh, say, four to five offices um, with some remote workers as well. Um, so I guess you can even include those and make it you know, 10 offices. <laughs> so when you're approaching the planning process, who gets included in, in the actual planning? Yeah, you know, we definitely want to make sure we have key leaders in, in you know, certain areas. So we will look to a leader within our senior group, a leader within our manager group and and have them come to you know get in the room and say, okay, what do we want to accomplish with this session? Let's make sure we hear all voices um, all the way down to the administrative staff as well to make sure that we're again capturing all the the best feedback we can. Brent, what about you? Yeah, I think one of the the great things about the planning it, you know, from a small perspective. So we typically start with our management team, which is just really there's about three of us in that, and we kind of look and say, okay, what is the best way? But like Brandon said, we want to make sure that there's valuable and impactful feedback from all levels across, and it doesn't matter because there could be a great idea from our administrative, you know, assistant who could you know, flip the entire process on its head. Um, particularly, you know, I know in our firm, we tend to, I don't know if you want to say lose the process a little bit, particularly as we creep closer and closer to that April 15th, and you kind of throw the process on its head, or throw it out the window even. Um, and so how do we make sure that the process that we have all defined and agreed on can stay consistent all the way to the end? And sometimes, you know, the person that has the best um, feedback in that is not going to be me sitting, you know, at the top chair and dictating ideas. So we want to make sure we open it up. Um, and so we have as open an environment as possible from the get go. So that's one of the things that we start with from any debrief process. And that's a great segue into the next topic. So you, you've planned it, you figured out when you're going to have it, where you're going to have it. Um, and then on, on the next slide, who's going to participate and then how you're going to capture the feedback. So I've, I got lots of questions for you guys on this one. Um, so let's start with the first one, because um, I think it's really important is are you doing anonymous surveys in advance? How are you capturing good, honest feedback, especially in a small firm? But, but Brandon, let's start with you. Yeah, certainly when we approach any type of retreat or, or session like this, we, we definitely want to um, obtain as much uh, feedback as we can to help even plan the process, make sure that we're covering the most important topics. Um, so we will, in, in most cases, we will do a kind of survey beforehand, try to identify again, our, our not our pain points per se, but make sure the most relevant topics are being addressed. And um, so we, we've given, given you a list of some of the questions that you might consider um, for our PCPS members. We've got an entire list of them and some other considerations that you can take into play. But Brent, in your 13 person firm, can you be anonymous when you're given feedback? It, it's hard, you know, it's really hard to really do it. And, and, and I have to say, so I'm a bit of a Tom Hood aficionado, you know, I'm, I'm in his fan club, the roadie group, but um, so we love the idea of this management by sticky note. And so creating an, an environment where ideas can be generated by the individual, even prior to actually sitting down for a collaborative meeting and getting those ideas kind of on the board, right? So that sticky notes getting posted up there. 
um, beforehand, right? Um, and, and yes, they're mostly not going to be anonymous at that point at our small firm, but we kind of try to uh, instill this idea. It's not about the people, it's about the process, right? So don't focus on a person did this wrong or right or screwed up a process, but what did the pro where did the process break and why did it break down? And then how do we kind of improve that or change it or fix it going forward? So you hit on a couple of really important things there. Um, it, it's important to not blame the individual. We're all gonna make mistakes, but what can we learn from that mistake to keep the process moving forward? Um, and it's interesting. So I'm envisioning when you talk about Tom's management by sticky notes and getting those in advance, I just imagine walking into a conference room in your office and, and seeing all these different colored sticky notes kind of building up as you get ready for your session. Do you, do you physically do it like that? We, we have. COVID, you know, threw us for a bit of a loop the last two years because I think as a small firm, we were literally running from thing to thing. But but yeah, that's what we've done is, uh, and you can do it, you know, with technology now, you can kind of create a whiteboard and team where people can go and say, okay, let me put an idea onto that whiteboard um, in advance, right? That's sitting out there. And, and then it gives an opportunity for other people, even before the meeting to go in and, and physically look at it, even if it's physically in a conference room and say, hey, what are some of these ideas or issues that people have presented. And then even from my perspective as a manager saying, okay, was it a failure in my process, right? In my ability to train on the process, right? Cause I do, I'm involved in a lot of the training cause we're a 13 member firm. So what did I fail at? Because maybe we already have a process that we didn't execute on around that, um, that idea, right? And yeah, it's I'll, often, I'll, um, I'll add, I'll just no, add to ahead, that. Brandon. Now, I'll just add to that. I think that the last couple of years, certainly through COVID, I mean, we've all we've all had to challenge ourselves on doing business differently and doing things a little differently and challenging clients on doing things differently. Um, and, you know, you, you you really need. And so there, there's there's going to be opportunities that things are going to go great opportunities, things are going to go gonna go bad. But you, again, you have to be willing to to accept that feedback and willing to. And the team has to be willing to be honest and say, look, we tried this and it didn't work. It's no one's fault. You know, it's not, we're not going to point at Brent and say, you know, it's your fault for failing to train us properly. It's like, look, we didn't get the proper training. We didn't know how to use the new technology or we didn't knew we, we failed to communicate properly on the, on the front end. So I think again, having an open mind on all sides is really important too. That reminds me of a saying that we used before one of our committee meetings. It's reserve the right to be offended. So just check that at the door. We're here to improve the process. We're not here to take it personally. So let's let's try to just be open and honest about it. So, Brandon, do, do you use an outside facilitator when you do your breakouts or when you do your debrief sessions? We, we have not historically. Um, and I, I know I think we mentioned this in an article. You know, it is it is something that is. It, it definitely need to look at it closer um, because I think an outside facilitator, again, back to the, um, the the pointing fingers or the taking the personal uh, relationships out of it. You know, as someone who's come from the outside, they're able to help move along conversations better. And sometimes people are more open and honest with someone who you know doesn't have a, nest, a say in how much that person gets paid. Um, so it does help to have um, someone from the outside. Now there's issues with that too, but um, certainly we've, we've done that on some of our uh, you know, partner retreats, but we have not done that quite yet on, on a debrief session, but definitely something that is strongly um, considered, should be strongly considered. Yeah, and I think um, you can do it either way. Obviously, an outside facilitator can, can maybe be more engaged in making sure that everyone in the room is participating. And, and has the opportunity to give feedback, but, but you're right. I think either way can certainly work. One of the things we like, or we've used, and not purely in the debrief, but using an outside facilitator for, and, and Lisa, you kind of mentioned it in the sales cycle, right? Is getting somebody who is not intimately um, involved with our profession, but you're truly getting an outsider to our profession. Um, and there were a couple of people on Twitter in, in recent weeks kind of talking about this from, like the outsider perspective is they they get to be the facilitator and kind of say, 
well, let's bring things from other sales and marketing or, or other types of organizations into not just the debrief, but our processes in general, where, you know, we're super analytical people. We're very, you know, thoughtful. Hey, I'm thinking A to B to C, and they're going to bring something in that may kind of revamp how we're doing something completely and much better than we're currently doing it. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. So um, you mentioned remote employees. How are you thinking about engaging your remote employees in this debrief? Are you going to bring them in or are you going to like create their own little breakout table? We we um, we we don't have um, a lot of remote employees. We probably have a handful now, but they're certainly during, during the peak of COVID. We were challenged with with having uh, kind of facilitating that. And we've gone, sometimes they come into our main office or main location, they come to Baton Rouge, which is our, um, our, our hub. And we'll, we'll bring everybody in. We'll have, you know, an afternoon session and get some fun to, to make sure that we also mix a little fun into, to work. Um, other times we've used, you know, different platforms to have our remote folks break out in their own and have sort of discussion because, the remote folks as well will have a different process. They'll, they may have different issues that are not uh, that we won't see when we're in the office. They have their own unique challenges. Uh, so it is very important to get their insights um, and input because, again, they're valuable team members. I, I want to come back to that fun piece, but I, I want to dig into something else before we, we go down the, the fun part. Um, how do you keep this from turning into a whining session? Or, you know, just a, how do you not go into the rabbit hole? How do you keep this with an eye on the um, focusing on improvement? I need your best tips. Come on. I'll defer to Brent because he sounds like he's got it figured out. <laughs> I, I do not have it figured out by, I, I guess you could say we wind outside of the debrief a lot. So that's, a, it, you know, you get it all out. Well, and I think that's part of it, right? One of your tips is where is that opportunity for somebody to, to vent, to whine? And a lot of times I think that's the one-on-one, -on -one, right? Like grabbing them, you know, and again, we're small, but again, breaking it down and looking at teams and, and core teams and saying, hey, you know, give me the opportunity to just be a wall. I'm just going to listen and tell me everything that kind of went wrong. And at that point, hey, you can be a little specific. Maybe it's client issues. Maybe it's people issues, um, but I'll just be a wall. And then you know, you get that off your chest. And now when we go into the debrief, we can be more um, people or process specific, excuse me. Um, yeah. Given them that opportunity, you've listened intently and and given them that chance to talk about it. So now we can we can move forward. Yeah, okay. exactly. Right. Okay, give me your best fun ideas. Do you do um, a baseball game? Do you do a service component? How do you create some fun at a debrief? Uh, we, we serve beer and uh, alcohol no, um, <laughs> <laughs> and talk about LSU. Uh, we, um, we mix it up every, uh, we, we, we went to a jump place one time. Uh, we went to Top Golf. We, uh, again, that's usually kind of after we, we get through our session, we, we try to, you know, go bowling, just do something a little more social, just to have fun. That I think the, I guess the most interesting um, thing we did have one, uh, one of our debriefs was to ask, ask people, like you had one thing, if you had one process that you would get rid of within the entire firm, you know, what would it be? And we got some interesting feedback on that and feedback that was somewhat surprising. Um, but again, I think that was quote fun just to be able to have people, you know, in, in a lighthearted way to some degree, because we didn't want it to turn into a wine session per se, but it was just, you know, what, what's the one thing that just kind of makes you less inefficient and just you would love to kill. Um, so I think that was I a fun, that idea. That was a kind of a fun event or fun uh, Exercise. item that we played with. But yeah. Brent, can you top that? I, I can't top that, but uh, I know one of the things that we've done as a firm and, and not during COVID, but pre COVID is um, and, and I think it's a little bit personality of the people in our firm is um, there's all, there's almost always been a Marvel movie that's been coming out right after tax season for like the last 10 years, it feels like. So, um, we'll typically close the office and take the entire office, uh, to a Marvel movie, you know, drinks and popcorn and candy and 
Um, and again, it's that time to just say, hey, I'm not worried about work. And, you know, I'm with work people and then and we can build a relationship there. But, um, uh, you know, and that's in service is a great one, right? That that gets people, uh, again, thinking less about themselves and more about somebody else. And how can I help somebody else? And I think that can change even your debrief process, right? Like, okay, how can I use this process to help somebody else in the process, right? Or by making a change to help an admin with getting a tax return out the door or a staff with getting a tax return completed. I, I love the service component. We haven't done it, but I love that idea of kind of changing the focus from inward to outward. So as we move to our um, our closing slide, I will tell you that one of my favorite days of the year is our CPA Day of Service. Um, the, the firm services team will go to um, volunteer at a food bank or in a community garden and highly recommend getting out with your team and doing something that, to Brent, to your point, is focused on someone other than yourself. All right, so um, we've got about three minutes left, and I, I think this is really important. So you've gone through your debrief process, you've prioritized, you've identified issues, you've prioritized them. Now, how do you make sure they don't just fall into the morass of the day to day? How do you build accountability around implementing these items that you've, you've worked so hard to identify? I, I would say there's kind of three things that, that stick out to me is one, prioritize, right? You're going to have a long list of things that went wrong and, and could have been better. And and that management by sticky note really comes into play, right? You get those votes on it, you get those circle stickers and saying, hey, these are these are our top things. And then two is um, prior, uh, identify a champion, right? So once you prioritize, you get those top two or three ideas only, right? I would not go beyond about three. Um, and you then get a champion who's going to be kind of spearheading that that process. And then the third thing is don't follow up, but follow through, right? Is coming back to that and coming back to that champion and saying, okay, what have we redocumented in our process? What have we fixed? How are we going? What resources do you need more to continue with this process evolution? And if we aren't giving you enough, what can we do to give you more to get through it? Yeah, I like that what Brent said on the uh, prioritizing. I think too in the prioritizing, certainly you have the the, the core management team that's going to have you know priorities and uh, what they're looking to accomplish. But I like the, the the thought of upvoting, you know, the the items on the sticky notes. You know, allow the team to go around and say, oh, that's a pretty good idea. Let me upvote that. And you know, people enjoy that social aspect of 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 upvoting and 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 trying to again help help prioritize what the leadership team should be doing. And ultimately, as Brent mentions, we, we need to have champions to take that on and also to uh, follow through. That's great. Thank you both so much for your insights. You're, you're in the trenches insights, as I like to call them. We appreciate it. And um, we'll see you in the open forum. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks. Thanks. That was a fantastic uh, session there, Lisa. A lot of, a lot of great insights. Uh, debriefing and thinking how you do things is, is so critical in, in this fast moving age that we all live in. So now we're going to we're going to move to our, our next topic here and talk about client advisory services. And we'd like to bring uh, Dan Hood up uh, to join Lisa and I for this discussion. Uh, Dan, I mean, we've been we've been working on this for uh, for a decade plus now. Yep. And it is, I think we're at another uh, inflection point. And I, I, love, I love your quote here. So first, uh, thanks for all that you do at, at Accounting Today, uh, a great resource for the profession and, and welcome to the town hall. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We, uh, we love these town halls. I was telling Eric, um, as, we, as I found out that I got to talk to Dan this week on the town hall, I'm like, I read accounting today every day. Um, so highly awesome. encourage you. If you're not reading accounting today, you need to. Very cool. Thank you. And what we're going to do is we're going to unpack uh, a, a recent issue, which had uh, the top 100 survey in it. Uh, but first, I mean, this, this is this is a statement here and what we can move to the next slide. But, you know, the, the highest uh, growth that you've seen in the, in the past past 40 years and so this is this is uh, out of your uh, 2022 top 100 report, which is based on a, 
2021 survey. Yep. Um, and look at this, uh, CAS client accounting services. Some people call it, we call it client advisory services and BPO business process outsourcing is ranked as number one. And we've never, this is a, we do this, this uh, uh, question in every year survey. We've done it for uh, over 30 years and we've never seen anything sort of climb up the ranks like this in terms of uh, a widespread <clears throat> uh, dissemination across the top 100. So what this is actually registering is how many of the top 100 firms are offering this service and seeing growth in it. So all of you know 84% of the top 100 firms saw growth in this area in, uh, in 2021. We've never seen anything that wasn't a test services um uh, achieve this this widespread uh, success across uh, the top 100, and and you'll see we got another slide that'll show it sort of growth over the year. We've never seen anything rise up the ranks in terms of of the the large numbers of firms that are offering it uh, the way way Cass has. It's just uh, it's been pretty spectacular. We've seen seen some ones that get big pops when they arise. New services like you know, back in the day when Sox came out or IFRS Consulting or something like that, but none of them have had this sort of relentless rise to the top. It's really pretty uh, pretty amazing. Well, I remember we've been talking about this for a number of years, and we've said it was very, it was it was a much more strategic area. I mean, you know, the right of bookkeeping maybe wasn't, and it became much more strategic. And what really happened over the past two years is it's become a, a must-have service yep. because there's so many businesses that needed this type of support during the pandemic. And and on top of that. I, I know a number of firms are looking at this as, as almost the quarterback service where they're beginning to fold the tax services under the client client advisory service. And one thing, this is a survey to the top 100. We do surveys to all the firms, you do surveys to all the firms. And I talk to small firms all the time about how exciting this line is. So Lisa, just maybe a couple of comments from you. I, um, I think that this is such a growing opportunity for small firms, and it's that chance to move beyond, you know, just the the cycle of compliance to compliance to compliance deadline, and an opportunity to really dig in with your clients and add that value that you have. So, yeah, just throughout, we do another survey where uh, across all firms of all sizes, and last year's survey showed up that uh, around 33% of sole practitioners and firms with two to five partners, they were offering CAS or plan to start offering it this year. So, yeah, it's definitely not just uh, restricted to the top 100. It's uh, it's available to everybody. Well, Dan, I mean, when I think about this service, I do think about this as we're still in the early stages, but this just, in this show, you know, in some ways, this might get to 100%, but Talk about this trend line. Well, that's yeah, exactly. You start that you know, five years ago, it was half of the top 100 firms. Now we're approaching what is going to rapidly become statistically, basically all of them, but 84% of them offering this service. Uh, but to your point that it is relatively new, you know, about a third of these firms hadn't been offering it five years ago. And what we've seen in, in some of the, the more verbatim anecdotal responses we see to the survey is that they're still working on this. They're still figuring it out, figuring out what, it, what they want it to be. Uh, it's evolving as they get involved with it. So a lot of them start with, and this is true both for the top 100 and for other firms as well, start with a more of a focus on the compliance work, the, the what you described, sort of the write-up sort of aspects of CAS uh, enabled by by cloud technology. But then as they, as they have more experience, as the firms have more experience with it, what they start to realize is that what they really want to do is shift the focus uh, from the compliance work, you know, well, we closed your books, we paid your bills, we got your payroll done, and shift that focus to more of the advisory work. Uh, the, you know, here's an opportunity for your company. Here's a thing we notice with other businesses that work in your industry that you should be trying. Fo moving that is really important because uh, that's the stuff they can't get from anyone else, right? You, they can't, they, they're they not going to find it from any of the uh, other providers. I think we may talk about some. There is some competition in uh, for, the, for the compliance work, for that back office work, um, but there is no real comp competitors for the ability to bring advice and advisory services. And that's, you said you call it client advisory services. It started as client accounting services. Some people then said CAS with the client accounting and advisory services, but we're really seeing, particularly for the firms that have been in it for a while, they're really shifting more to that client client advisory services mindset. Yeah, we, we, we like to stick to three letter acronyms too. So, <laughs> so this here, at least you look at this, these are uh, two quotes from two of the firms in the survey and a number of couple of takeaways here. You know, it's about, you know, tailoring your solutions and p there's questions coming in. I'm seeing the questions coming in. Again, people are saying, what is, you know, what is, what is CAS? Define it a little bit more. 
you know, at the, at the very basic level, it's, it's doing the bill payment, it's doing the accounting work, it's doing the monthly close, it's doing, you know, some, some of the, the controllership. And then it really, it really expands into that advisory element where when we know firms that are they, they really to drive success, you're focusing on a vertical, you become an expert in a vertical, if it be it restaurant, be it professional services, be it new uh, technology startups. Uh, and then the other thing that's beginning to evolve is just making sure you've got an, an integrated tech stack. Those are things that we're working on. So Lisa, maybe some additional comments from you on how you see firms driving success. I think I'll go back to what you said about what is CAS. And I think there's such a broad spectrum that firms can start at a basic level and then build their capabilities, build their strategy, and create some discipline around what client market they want to serve or what services they want to offer and then build out from there. So we're seeing the most success with firms who have a clearly defined strategy, have a, you know vision around what their ideal client looks like and what their service offerings are going to be. But this is a real opportunity to be entrepreneurial and to help your clients in a way that leverages your business insights and that trusted advisor status, because this allows you to talk with them more deeply rather than just giving them a cold set of financials that were from six weeks ago with no context and no anticipatory look. So firms of all sizes have an opportunity to build the practice that they want to. Well, we can move on in this and, and talk a little bit about, you know, this market is there's tremendous opportunity. I mean, just this is this is going to be a category that I think we'll, we'll look back on five years from now. And every small business under 20 million dollars is going to consider outsourcing their accounting services. Just today, one thing is like 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 businesses consider outsourcing payroll. You're going to outsource your accounting services because there's just so much advantage, so many advantages of leveraging a, a, a cloud-based platform with professional support that can be supplied through a CPA firm. Here's a company called Pilot. And Pilot is looking to provide these client accounting services. Here it's a, you know, Jeff Bezos is investing in a lot of things. He's investing in accounting uh, here as well. And this is something that yeah, it's good for us to be aware of, but I can tell you this, the firms are, are well, well positioned to win. And that's because of the trusted advisor role that Lisa just spoke about. So Dan, maybe just some comments from you is because you're, you're pretty familiar with, with the overall market and what's occurring. Right. Well, that's, it's really, that's a, uh, that's the thing is that it's you bringing that that expert advice, bringing that familiarity with business, but also specifically with the businesses and the industry uh, that you're focusing on. That that's not what's being brought by the pilot. So you can almost think of it, put maybe in a way as, as sort of the H and R blocks or the Jackson Hewitts. They're providing you know for very simple businesses mm -hmm. with without a lot of interest or not a lot of strategic vision. That's going to be fine for them. But for businesses that want to grow. Uh, that's an opportunity for accountants to come in and say, yeah, we'll take care of all that stuff. But because we take care of all that stuff, we're also able to get insights into your business and offer you this tremendous advice to grow. And so it's 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 hugely valuable for the client uh, in a way that, and I don't want to diss pilot or anything like that, but it, you know, in a way that pilot can't be because it doesn't bring that trusted advisor uh, expertise the way, the way the CPA profession does. Uh, there's just, they can't compete on that level. And so that's why one of the reasons we're seeing firms move more towards that. And one of the things that happens is that a key element of CAS or what we hear from a lot of people is, is structure, standardization of processes. And that's much easier to do for uh, the back office stuff, the, the bookkeeping and, and the bill pay and that stuff. It's much easier to automate that and create a process for that. Much harder to do that around advisory services who so are seeing firms start with the uh, uh, standardization of the compliance and then figure out the standardization of the advice and also getting all their people comfortable doing that. Um, and so that as they come along to that, that's where they're really cementing the, the value and the, their value value proposition. Yeah, in, in some ways, what this does, well said, this is legitimizing uh, the, the space here. So what, what how are we thinking about this? And this is something that AICPA and CPA.com are, are working on. Lisa and I actually just spent the past couple of days with a CAS advisory council. We're really trying to put together the frame we are putting together, the framework and the methodology on how you can build a truly scalable cash practice. And this is for firms of all sizes. 
some of the things you could look in this slide here and say, small firm, you know, I have less strategy and governance. That's, that's correct, but it's still important. And you know, clearly the larger firms need to think more about that. And that's something that they're doing. So these are the four pillars and we are advancing a lot of, I mean, there's been a lot of questions here today and we're going to have a, a town hall session with some practitioners where we unpack and talk a little bit more about these four pillars. But we, this movement, we're, we're doing CAS 2.0. We do think that the CAS area should be equal to the assurance and the tax area in the firm. It's a, it's a huge opportunity. It's very strategic. And this is something that clearly uh, we want to invest in. Lisa, I mean, you, you were here for the last couple of days. Uh, comments uh, from, from the discussions that you and I both had with the firms. I'll, I'll just say that it's really exciting to see what the vision is behind the roadmap that we're, we're looking to create for firms so that they can, again, build that strategy, create some discipline, and then build the capabilities and, and the consistency that will help drive this forward. But it's, it's very exciting. And um, we'll be bringing you more to more about the opportunities. So Dan, I mean, you've, so this is kind of, this is the evolution. When, when you look at this, what, what, do, what does it make you think about? Well, it really is, is that it's, again, I go back to that structure element. I love this, this, uh, this set of pillars. I think they make, they make perfect sense. And it's, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you could apply to almost any service area, but, but particularly for CAS, because it's a combination of advisory services and, and compliance work, it's great to have the, uh, a structure around it where you have repeatable processes that you can take to scale, uh, because that's going to be the value of, uh, of CAS going forward is the ability to do this for large numbers of clients, but still provide that sort of specialized advice that they're going to need, that they're going to need. And I think approaching it in a strategic structured way is a, is a big plus. Well, there's been a lot of questions about training. There is a lot we, we've been, we've been investing in this for a decade. Uh, we've got workshops, we've got training classes, online classes, and that that's important. And you, and you also need to understand, you know, how to use the technology solutions. I would advise you not just to jump into, you know, the technology solution, uh, you know, discussion first, think about the practice area, think about the strategy, the vertical you want to focus on. And actually, Lisa, you know, we talked last week about building a SOC practice. This isn't something you need to do overnight. You could think about this as a, is actually a multi-year journey. Absolutely. It's it, everything is a, is a path to um, building out those capabilities. And um, I, th I think we're working really hard to create that, that path for you. So we've got, just like you, we had the, uh, the tax season survey, we've got the 2022 CAS benchmark survey. If you're in the CAS area, uh, we'd welcome your input and uh, we'll give you early access uh, to the results. So another, uh, another opportunity for you to collaborate with us. That's what these town halls are all about, uh, collaborating with you. Uh, so with that, I want to bring up, we're gonna have a lot of, a lot of panelists here. <laughs> Uh, for, for the for the open forum, I will kick it off, Lisa. Let you maybe okay. uh, ask, ask the, ne the next next question. But Mark, a lot of questions came in on uh, uh, life of relief. I'll let you expand <laughs> on that. Yeah. Uh, so there there has been some legislation bouncing around, and the legislation is focused on car dealers uh, providing some relief. Um, the, the issue is the vehicle to get it done. So the possibility could be that the uh, China competitiveness bill that I mentioned earlier, although uh, germaneness is a stretch or another possibility could be um, something at the year end with tax extenders. So there is a possibility out there. Again, what, what the discussions has been around car dealers, uh, we are supportive across industries. So we're supportive much beyond car dealers, but that's what's bouncing around. We have been been uh, pushing on the on Treasury um, in order to try and, and provide some relief. The response from them has been that they do, do not have the authority and they need they need legislation. So a uh, quick question to Brandon and Brent. As part of your debrief, we talked about um, the idea of giving everyone the chance to vote a process off the island. But do you also build in voting a client off the island? Absolutely. Both of you do. And do you do that in your debrief or is that a separate conversation? We do it separately. Yeah. So we want to make sure right, coming back to this idea of people versus process. So debrief is process and then the people will come later. You know, we try to do that 
end of the year, right? Coming into, you know, post pay, you know, September where post October 15th, we can kind of get that disengagement letter out and say, hey, sorry, we're just not able to next year kind of a thing. Brent, you make me want to go back to the slides and, and add in another big line. It, the debrief is process, will, will not people. So that's that's a great way to summarize the intent of the debrief session. Brandon, anything from you? Same. I, I, I agree. Well, we're constantly looking at if we if we have the right clients, we're serving the right clients, if the clients value our, our firm. And um, that's almost a constant yearly. Um, I don't know if there's any one time we look at it. Um, it it's it's a kind of a, a rolling thing for us, um, okay. but certainly part of the process. Thank you. Well, on that, we're, we we got a couple another minute here and some announcements. So it's been another great power hour. Uh, Brendan, Brent, uh, Dan, Carrie, Mark, thank you. Let's uh, we can bring bring. bring Yeah, uh, ten minute the ten minute uh, top issue survey. You can keep Lisa up here. Uh, please fill out that survey. Here's our in summary. So uh, some great great takeaways uh, for you. Recent town halls, leverage those. Uh, we also have a great town hall coming up on May nineteenth. Uh, we're going to try to work harder on making sure you know the content that we have in an upcoming town hall. We're going to bring Marcy Russell back. Uh, talk about where the economy is going. She gives a great update in January, but a lot has changed in, in Barry Balance and uh, will we'll be with us as well. So Lisa, we it's been another good uh, good power hour. We got to we got to show, show show the audience here. <laughs> where, you know, so we're we got to figure out when we see you guys in person, uh, we'll give you some of these uh, these these physical town hall uh, uh, paraphernalia. So thank you for your uh, time today. Lisa, I'll give you uh, you know, cl closing remarks. Uh, hopefully we'll see you live at Engage. We're, we're always looking forward to that chance. And we're going to continue to bring you new strategic opportunities for you to consider throughout the rest of the year. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.